So the purpose of this evening and, and what we're aiming to do with it, as it says, is to recover the importance of the archives of religious congregations. Now, frequently, a lot of people don't know they exist or what they're about. And if they do, they're often underused, we find. And more than that, they're often underused in the wider circumstance. So sometimes people will just think, oh, they're to do with that religious congregation, that community, that order. But one of the things that's immediately apparent when you start investigating these materials is how they tie into matters of national, local, national, and international importance. You only have to look in recent times at, for example, the exhibitions around the Easter Rising in Dublin in 1916, the 100th anniversary, and to see the material from the capuchins that could be used to support that documentation of a big event. So today we're going to look at, for example, um, the involvement of religious community in the Enlightenment. So if you want to put on a wider one, what we could look as a new angle, the role of women within the Enlightenment. Or for example, we're also going to look at the spread of best practice in healthcare around the world. In other words, despite the temptation for some to believe this, including the holders of these collections, these archives reveal more than many first assumed. So I'll give you another example, just from, from Durham with ourselves, that in Ushaw College, the former Catholic seminary just outside the city, they hold St. Cuthbert's ring. And they know it's St. Cuthbert's ring that it was removed from the tomb of Cuthbert at the dissolution of the monasteries because it was kept by a community of female religious, the English Augustinians in Paris during penal times. And they kept records of where it came from and how they looked after it. And now it's in Durham. So that gives you just an idea of what this material can reveal on a, on a wider nature as well. So in other words, this is going to, we're going to be discussing the importance, um, even for those, if you like, you have no interest in perhaps the religious community, no immediate interest, that actually they need to know about it themselves, as do the communities and religious congregations. So as Paul mentioned, we've been running a few projects in Durham about this. We have a series of research projects working at the moment in collaboration with congregations. And we're going to hear from a number of these over the next couple of days. And of course, we should add that if anybody is interested in this work or if they're a religious congregation, they should feel the need to, they, or, they feel, or they feel the need to begin investigating it, please do contact me and email me and just look, up, look me up on the Durham University website. Um, I'd also say as well, just on archives, that we're going to hear about how some of these have been relocated to Durham University. And I just want to make a quick plea that if you do look after an archival collection, please do look after it and think about how you're using it and what you're going to do with it if your community is reaching, um, if it's reaching conclusion um, or completion. Because one of the worst things that we hear about sometimes are things being lost or being disposed of just in the general hubbub of what happens uh, when things do reach completion. And so just to flag that we're going to be holding a workshop in September with the Catholic Archive Society, which will be a virtual workshop talking about how to look after your archive and to think about some of these plans that are going on. Now, I want us to introduce our first speaker. I'm going to do fairly brief introductions. And so our first speaker is going to be Professor Kathleen Strauss Cummings, who's a professor in the Department of American Studies and Department of History at the University of Notre Dame in the US. She's also director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism at the university. Her most recent book is A Saint of Our Own, How the Quest for a Holy Hero Helped Catholics Become American. But what I really want to do today actually is just to thank her before we even begin, because Kathleen is actually going to be teaching in about 50 minutes time. So she's going to have to duck off after the questions, but we're really grateful that she's made the time to join us with that teaching that's going to be happening. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Paul. Thanks to everyone at the Center for Catholic Studies. I'm absolutely delighted to be here with all of you this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to speak to this group on this important topic. And I just want to make clear that I will be speaking primarily as a historian of women, as a historian of the United States, which is how I was trained. Although I have evolved as the field has, and that's part of what I'll be talking about today, about some new directions and some boundaries we should be crossing as we approach this subject. Uh, so what you're seeing here is uh, a picture of the 11th Triennial Conference on the History of Women Religious, which is a conference that I direct under the auspices of the Kushwa Center, the center I also direct. 
And this most recent meeting was held in June of 2019. We have just issued a call for papers for the next meeting, which will be held at the University of Notre Dame, where I teach um, across the street from St. Mary's in June of 2022. I want you to notice, you can see, this is not a very good picture. I know many of the people uh, pictured here are on this call and uh, it's great to see all of you virtually. I want you to also notice this 1844 to 2019, which is St. Mary's College uh, celebrating its 175th anniversary. And that'll be important for what I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, I have been studying the history of Catholic women religious for a quarter century now. I was thinking back to my first trip to a religious archives, which was in um, the late 1990s. I went to Trinity College in Washington, D.C., which was one of the first Catholic women's colleges in the United States. In fact, the first to be founded explicitly as a college, not evolved from a secondary institution as St. Mary's. Um, college in Indiana had done. So it was a chaotic story of its founding that involved a Vatican investigation, accusations of heresy, concerns about co-education. It was just uh, a third of a mile away from Catholic University of America, the Pontifical University, uh, a really wild story. And the only source I had found in the library at the University of Notre Dame, where I was then a graduate student, um, had a tantalizing sentence by an anonymous sister of Notre Dame de Namur, asking, responding to a question about how Sister Julia McGrody had founded Trinity College. And she said, Sister Superior prayed and Trinity was started, period. So I knew there was more to the story and I knew I'd have to go to the archives to find it, which I did, and I found wonderful stories there. But really important was a letter that Sister Julia had written to her community in February of 1901, right after Trinity College had opened. And the gist of it is here, but she was exhorting the sisters not to talk about the complications that had gone on in, involve, in uh, involving Trinity's founding, because they had been asked by the vice rector of nearby Catholic University, um, reminded that like the dear blessed mother, the sisters had been chosen to do great things. And like her too, they should be satisfied that he alone be witness of their cooperation with his grace. Because the Blessed Virgin had not published her history to the world, neither should the sisters be concerned whether people know what we do or not. I understood that anonymous sister's reticence, but I also began to understand and have spent uh, a long time since trying to understand that one of the consequences that belonging to a religious tradition that has historically expected women to be more self-effacing than men is the distortion of the historical record. In all histories of Catholic higher education in the United States, it is in fact Reverend Garrigan who is credited as being the actual founder of Trinity, the one who had allegedly persuaded Sister Julia to open a college, not a secondary academy, which is goes controverts the archival evidence. So uh, this is a recurring pattern in the history of Catholicism, as my uh, colleague Sue Ellen Hoy memorably said that obscurity and, and obscurity and invisibility, which are part and parcel of any study of women, are particularly troublesome when they are sought after and considered measures of success, as it was in this instance. It's somewhat remarkable then that given how long I've been aware of and attentive to this pattern, that it's very long escaped my notice right under my nose. And I'm going to speak now about the local context at the University of Notre Dame and St. Mary's College. In connection with a course that I'm teaching, in fact, the one I'll be teaching in uh, less than an hour from now, um, and also thinking about our conversation we're having on both sides of the Atlantic and throughout the world about public monuments and how we recognize stories, origin stories, and who we recognize, I decided to pay a bit more careful attention to the founding of Notre Dame and the story that we tell about that. Pictured here is uh, Father Edward Soren, a Holy Cross priest who arrived in Notre Dame in 1842. He had started out in Southern Indiana in the Diocese of Vincennes, but because of a conflict with the bishop, uh, wound up moving uh, up here to South Bend where I am today. This is another vantage point of what the territory looked like, not mapped according to state, but mar mapped according to diocesan boundaries. Here's the Diocese of Vincennes. So Father Soren would have traveled from here uh, up here and arrived on a freezing cold day 
in uh, early December and uh, wrote a letter to his superior back in France um, in which he was staring out at a frozen, what he thought was one lake because it was covered by snow, but it was actually two lakes. Um, so Notre Dame, the official Notre, uh, name of Notre Dame is University of Notre Dame du Lac, um, which is an error. It was actually two lakes, not one. But anyway, he wrote to his superior back in France, Basil Moreau, outlining his vision for the university that he would build. And this, an excerpt from this letter appears on what's known as the Founders Plaque, which is in this very spot that Father Soren was standing. This is a letter that was written on the 5th of October in 1842. And um, this is the last paragraph of what appears on the plaque. And I have highlighted um, the line, this college will be one of the most powerful means of doing good in this country. You can imagine how often we quote this line around here. It is a wonderful um, marketing tool for Notre Dame to speak of itself as a force for good and, and to talk about how that was part of the founder's vision from its very inception. I decided to go to the original source to look at another part of the letter which references indigenous Potawatomi on whose traditional homeland the University of Notre Dame was founded. And that was my intention in going to this letter. But uh, when I did, I found a very interesting uh, elision in the excerpt. So here is uh, in gold what appears on the founder's plaque. But notice what appears in white. From the very moment of its founding, Father Soren had an intention to have the sisters come, meaning the Sisters of the Holy Cross, and uh, to not only perform domestic work, but also for teaching and perhaps to the establishment of an academy. So here in the center of Notre Dame's origin story are the sisters who would in fact come to Notre Dame in 1843 and stay for 115 years. At the high point, there were over 100 sisters of the Holy Cross working at Notre Dame, although there was a separate community founded just across the street at St. Mary's, not a separate community, but a separate, um, separate convent whence they opened their academy in 1844. Um, but yet this is a largely unknown story and completely, uh, almost completely erased from history. In the archives of the, the Holy Cross, the provincial archives of the Holy Cross priest, uh, there is a remarkable source that marks the departure of the sisters in 1848, when the last sisters of the Holy Cross went across the street to join the rest of their community at St. Mary's College. And I'm not going to read all of this out, uh, and uh, it's really a remarkable source that speaks volumes about the work that the sisters did, how essential it was to the flourishing of Notre Dame. And what I've highlighted here are some of the words that uh, glorify the sisters' labor, acknowledge how essential it was, um, and, and yet anticipate that it will be uh, long forgotten and buried as indeed it has. The middle paragraph here, Father Thorin became very upset when the sisters did in fact try, did begin to open their academy, worried that the sisters were shirking what he understood as their first duty. Who was to keep the pot boiling at Notre Dame? Who was to make the pies and cook the tough beef? Who would wash and mend and iron? Elsewhere in the very few sisters are named in this particular source. Um, and in fact, it talks about the nicknames that the students gave the sisters based on the dishes that they prepared in the student dining hall. So Sister Pie and Sister Steak were their nicknames. In the last paragraph here, Father Soren goes on, uh, sorry, uh, the author goes on to say that the great pity of this departure uh, is that a coming generation will forget the debt. Is there any lasting way Notre Dame's debt can be paid? Thank God, in one sense, there is no way. And it goes on to say that any earthly payment, a temporal payment, uh, would be inadequate. Um, I think this is one way that studying sisters' contribution to a myriad of institutions, Notre Dame being only one of them, is a way we can think about what is often um, uh, relationship, an inverse relationship, in the sense that the more labor, the more highly valued labor is in the rhetoric, the less recognized it is and certainly compensated in reality. And I think we can find many analogies, I think, for example, of the glorification of motherhood or in today's 
context, very relevant, how we speak about essential workers in the midst of a pandemic. Closer to uh, the topic of this uh, conference though, is I think that there is a way that Notre Dame uh, can and should repay the debt. And I wanna talk about the founding of the Conference of the History of Women Religious that I mentioned earlier. In October of 1987, the Kushwa Center, which I now direct, uh, hosted a colloquium on the history of women religious, which brought together historians and archivists uh, who were working on the history, mostly of their own congregations. This, uh, this was, did not come out of the blue. This was part of an evolution of um, an emerging field of Catholic women's history in which sisters who of course had always chronicled their history, both uh, prim early on primarily for the benefit of their own members in formation. Um, but there was starting in the wake of the Second Vatican Council and other developments, um, a more critical history and importantly, a way to think about sisters across congregational boundaries. So a landmark book is Sister Mary Evans book, which was originally published as a dissertation in American studies in 1978, um, which was one of the first studies that reflected a contemporary approach of social history, adopted a more critical edge and began to consider the history of, of sisters small s, not the history, not internalized histories of congregations. Other developments were uh, cross in cross Congregational collaboration um, had resulted from a, a study sponsored by the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, the umbrella organization for Catholic Sisters in the United States, which tried to gather archival data and uh, supplemented Elizabeth Colmer's 1978 essay in American Quarterly on religious women in the United States, later, later published as a magisterial survey. At this first gathering, um, most of the participants, the vast majority of the participants were Catholic sisters who were serving as archivists or historians of their own congregations. Most of them held academic positions at the colleges founded by the respective communities. At the high point in 1967, there were about 120 Catholic women's colleges in the United States. There were only a handful of non-sisters present, uh, Professor Jay Dolan, then the director of the Kushwa Center, some other faculty members at the University of Notre Dame, and two female historians who were not themselves members of religious communities, Margaret Susan Thompson and Catherine Kish Sklar, then two of the preeminent scholars in the emerging field of US women's history. This gathering resulted in the establishment of the History of Women Religious Network, which was founded separately from the Kushwa Center and met for the first time at the College of St. Catherine in St. Paul, Minnesota in June, 1989. There were 251 participants at that conference, including historians, archivists, people uh, representing Canada, Australia, the Philippines, and France, as well as scholars from 31 states um, in the United States. There were 21 <laughs> people who were not members of religious communities. Uh, three of them were men and 104 distinct congregations were represented. This conference has met every three years since, most recently as previously noted at St. Mary's College in Indiana. For 25 years, uh, Sister Callen Karen Canelli, who's pictured uh, right here, had run the Conference on the History of the Women Religious the way sisters had led so many institutions and organizations with no budget, no help, and no formal structure. In 2013, however, it had become too difficult for her to do on her own, and she asked me to absorb it into the Kushwa Center, which I had agreed to do for the remainder of my time as director. The conference is now at a pivotal moment, and it is not clear whether it will survive or even if it should. Some suggest that the conference, having accomplished to a certain degree its founding goal of integrating Catholic sisters into larger narratives, should dissolve itself. Um, I believe that there is still a place for the conference. There is still, uh, still a great deal more work to be done and significantly more people ready to do it. But like everything else, it has had to evolve and adapt. And so if the conference had its origins in the crossing of boundaries, in co crossing of congregational boundaries, I would also suggest that therein lies its future. And I wanna talk just briefly about three kinds of boundaries that it should be crossing. 
The first and most important is a boundary between sisters and scholars, or I, I, I should say more broadly, between congregations and historians and archivists, because they are no longer interchangeable as they were at, at this first meeting. At that most recent conference pictured, there were 137 presenters on the program. We had more attending, but 137 presenters. Of those, 30 were sisters. I will not venture to guess their age. We did not ask their age, but I will say that none appeared to be um, in their youth, I suppose. Um, it was clear that none held academic positions in part because the number of US Catholic women's colleges has declined precipitously. Um, most of the women who are entering religious life in the United States, at least today, are not becoming academic historians. So I think this is true, so a, a factor we've had to come to terms with. The history of Catholic sisters will largely be written by people who are not themselves members of religious communities. This has significant implications for archives. Lay scholars cannot write the histories of women religious or men without access to the archives. These, uh, I can say that this has become much easier to do than it was when I first started out, um, gaining access, which uh, could be difficult for outsiders to do. But of course, um, convent archives are private collections and some religious orders are not inclined to welcome outsiders and some don't have the ability to do so. So I think we need um, as a field to think creatively about how to do that. And I know uh, Durham is encouraging that uh, very much and uh, James opening comments reflect that. I also think it means that if outsiders are going to be the majority of, and, and this can be a very good thing. I know that most of the people that come to present at the conference do not necessarily consider themselves historians of Catholic sisters. They consider themselves historians of US foreign policy who are writing about sisters as missionaries in Central America. They consider themselves historians of race and are grappling with sisters complicity in enslavement. Um, this can be a very good thing when integrating sisters into larger narratives, but we don't want to write the history of sisters without sisters. And so I think, again, Durham is an example, and I know many of the projects that it has sponsored, I'm thinking particularly of the Religious Vitality Project sponsored by the Hilton Foundation, um, many other projects, I think can uh, provide an example of how we can creatively think about how sisters and scholars can work together. And uh, again, uh, this does not uh, just apply to sisters, but that is uh, my particular um, interest. Um, Having said that and recognizing that this conference is about the archives of men and women religious, I'll talk about the second boundary that I think we should be crossing as we imagine the future of uh, the history of Catholic religious. Um, and that is gender boundaries. At that 2019 conference, there were 23 men in attendance, which was a vast increase from HWR's early days. Um, but uh, I do think we need to think about incorporating not just men as uh, authors of the papers, but men as subjects. And I have this slide up here because it, it relates to the my most recent book, which James kindly mentioned, which is a history of Catholic saints in the United States. And um, pictured is Elizabeth Ann Seton, who's probably the best known of the 12 people from the United States or territory that later became a part of it who are now canonized saints. Um, and she's on the cover there, but it's very clear that she would never have been canonized were it not for the efforts of Sister Isabel Tui, who was the uh, superior of the Daughters of Charity and who labored valiantly in a conflict with a Vincentian priest who oversaw Elizabeth Ann Seton's cause from 1939 until he died in 1959. And in fact, it's a longer story, but it was his death that permitted Seton's cause to move forward. I, I mention this because I was able to find out about this conflict and uh, many other issues related to that, not by going to the archives of the Daughters of Charity, uh, Sister Isabel destroyed most of her papers related to this conflict, but by going to the Vincentian archives in Philadelphia, which had more of the material. So I think I was able to, to think very recently about how um, 
and, and this relates to the source I shared from the Provincial Archives of Holy Cross at the beginning, that we can glean a great deal about the history of women religious by looking at men's archives and vice versa. So many of the projects, the endeavors of the Catholic Church were uh, spearheaded by men and women, perhaps unequal in power and unequal in credit, but uh, shared nonetheless. So I think we need to have more of an openness and more of a cooperative arrangement. And it's one of many reasons why I'm delighted to see the program on this particular conference. Um, I uh, will finish with a third boundary, and that boundary involves national boundaries. And I said at the outset, I was trained as a U.S. historian, um, but I have since uh, in concentrating on the Catholic Church, come to think about the Catholic Church as truly the global institution that it is, and history reflects that. So although the center, Kushwa, is called the Center for the Study of American Catholicism, it's become increasingly clear over my tenure as director that we cannot look at the history of the Catholic Church solely within the boundaries of the United States. I wanna talk about a source that helped me learn, uh, helped me really appreciate this, helped make this concrete. And it involves another canonized saint, um, probably the second best known after Elizabeth Ann Seton, and that is Francis Cabrini. I had started writing about Cabrini very much as a citizen saint as she was celebrated in 1946 when she became the first citizen to be canonized from the United, first US citizen to be canonized from the United States. And it was viewed as a national triumph. You can imagine 1946, the end of World War II, um, the US had its first saint and there were a lot of celebrations which celebrated her connection to the United States. So this is just one um, image in which she is pictured with an American icon of the Statue of Liberty. Um, if I read only sources published in the United States, I would think that uh, she was uh, just the most um, patriotic American ever. It was reading sources published in, uh, sources from the Holy See and sources in Italy that showed me that yes, while it was true, Cabrini had become a citizen of the United States, she had done so as a matter of expediency, not necessarily out of any love for the United States. In fact, her, it seems her lawyer had urged her to become a US citizen to facilitate her real estate transactions, which were substantial. I was working in the Vatican secret archives, um, now called the Vatican Apostolic Archives, and I will never be able to do justice to the splendor of this source, which was designed by Cabrini's successor as the, found, as the superior of the um, uh, MSCs, her congregation, that documents her 67 foundations throughout the world um, on three continents. It's embossed in gold, um, you know, everybody's always very quiet in the Vatican archives, but I, I really gasped when I unfolded this splendid source. Again, the reproduction does not do it justice. But to my point, um, this helped me to visualize that the United States was not the end all of Cabrini's mission. It was one of uh, many points um, in a triangle, a triangle that involved uh, Rome, South America, North America, and, and Europe. And she crossed the ocean some 24 times, mostly to be connected to Rome. So one of the things I've tried to do as director of the Krishwa Center that certainly applies to congregations of men and women religious is to think about what light Roman archival repositories can shed on uh, the experience of Catholics in the United States and beyond. Just, I'll close with a few more maps. This is a wonderfully enticing source that talks about Irish missionaries sent um, from uh, Ireland all over the world. And I'm involved in a project co-sponsoring with the University of Aberdeen that is uh, working with uh, scholars internationally to think about how we might understand Irish missionaries in the Anglophone world and, and perhaps beyond. Um, I think in, in American historiography, they're often lumped in as immigrants, um, but serving as a missionary is different from becoming, um, from serving as, um, from being an immigrant. And so I think first we have a lot of work to do to find out exactly how many people, men and women went, where they went uh, and how long they stayed. I'll, uh, my last observation is to go back to that map I showed at the beginning to, show you a little more clearly Father Soren's journey from Vincennes, Indiana to um, South Bend, Indiana. Um, I, I have since come to rely more and more heavily on diocesan maps in my teaching 
and in my scholarship, because I love what it does to the way we visualize the history of Catholics in the United States. It is not state boundaries that are the most prominent here. It is the diocesan boundaries. And this is the view from Rome. This is how the whole we see organized uh, the Catholic world. And this is where missionaries traveled. So Father Soren did not come to Indiana. He was sent to the Diocese of Vincennes. And I think that can help us cross national boundaries. I could go on about other boundaries that we should be crossing. Um, I think um, collaboration among um, Interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaboration is also important. Um, but I think I will stop with, with those those boundary crossings and now uh, take time for questions. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Kathleen. That was great. And it's going to feed into a number of talks we've got coming in a minute, particularly the mention of the transnational ideas, the global laws and the different disciplines coming at it. Um, I want us to be able to move on to questions quite quickly because I know you've got to go teaching. Um, I don't know who this one's from, because I haven't said, but uh, to thank you for your wonderful presentation and to say um, why are religious sometimes reluctant to let you into their archives? What is it that worries them sometimes when you are mentioning it? <laughs> well, um, I, I have to say this is changing. And, you know, there are all sorts of opportunities for me to feel my age these days. But I felt it recently when uh, one of my undergraduate students was reaching out to an archivist about a trip that she would like to take. And she said, are all archivists kind? She could not believe how welcoming and inviting they were. And with making it clear that I owe a debt to so many archivists, I will say that uh, when I was a doctoral student and early career, the first contact, it was not always kindness and welcome that was communicated. It was often, what do you want to see and why do you want to see it? Um, there was suspicion. There was fear in, in many cases. And I had to work to really establish my credibility as a scholar and to promise that I wasn't interested. And it's not that the archivist um, wanted to erase history, but there was kind of a, an, in, uh, an interesting insider effort to protect it. So it is it is improving. And I've certainly been welcomed by many, many archivists, uh, many of whom are on this call. So I don't want to understate that. But I think that is part of what we're seeing and how the field has evolved that um, that people are welcome um, and, and welcome as scholars. Uh, sometimes it's not always possible with financial limitations. Of course, now in COVID, uh, we have another uh, other crises. And we, I think we have to think about digitization. But um, in the early days, it was who are you and, and, and why would you want um, to visit here? I had a sister, just very quick story, who was very upset because I wanted, to, I was writing about sisters and education and she was visibly, her body language was just uh, really, um, she was becoming very upset. And, and I finally said, sister, I'm sorry, have I offended you in some way? And she said, there are sisters grades in those boxes. Um, and I said, it's from 1887. I, I promise I am never going to publish what grade a sister got in a particular course. Uh, but I think that was the instinct. This was um, this is from a, a wonderful woman who, um, you know, had not had much experience working with outsiders. Thank you. I think that and it plays very much into your idea of collaboration, that it works if you, you work with them, because it's slightly different worlds beginning to meet, perhaps, because I think it's fair to say that as these archives are getting more known about and access becomes possible, um, in terms of history, they're the real, they're the gold mine because nobody's really looked at these things. But with that, there has to come that understanding, like you said, with it. Um, we have a question from Liam Temple. Um, I'm going to read it because I'm just conscious of the time with you going, Kathleen. So you're not going to get to meet Liam with this, with this question. And he just asked, what are the major challenges facing the futures of Catholic religious archives in the US? Because he's wondering if they're different than the UK or elsewhere. I imagine they're much the same. There are, there are concerns about uh, who's going to run them as the numbers of religious shrink and as resources shrink. Um, I think that's part of this collaboration between historians and congregations is part convincing um, the congregations in an age of shrinking resources that it is worth the investment of um, 
hiring a lay archivist of combining archives. And uh, there are a number of efforts. There's an effort, I see Malachi McCarthy on the, on the, on the call. Um, there is an effort through Boston College to um, establish a, a national center for congregational archives. I know the University of Notre Dame acquires them. And even across the street at St. Mary's, I know the sisters are, are hoping to establish an archival center that would house not just their own archives, but the archives of other women religious. So I think we need to think uh, as collaboratively as collaborative as possible. And time is running short. I think we need to do this. Uh, time is of the essence. Great. And just one final question, which will be an easy one for you. <laughs> it's quickly from Anthony Weaver, who thanks you for a wonderful presentation. And he just said, could you explain what Kushwa means? Uh, Kushwa is the family name of our benefactors, yes, uh, so uh, it is not an acronym, it is, it is the family name and uh, really wonderful and the Kushwa family has been absolutely delighted that we have foregrounded the work of, of Catholic sisters and I think again, you know, to go back to that, um, I've had people say to me, why is the Conference for the History of Women Religious at Notre Dame? Why isn't it a Catholic women's institution? Um, and my response is that the work of Catholic women religious has been absolutely integral to the work of the church in, in this nation and beyond. And it's not something that it should be sidelined at an institution. It, it wasn't only for women, it was for the whole church and attaching it to uh, Notre Dame a force for good in the world um, is a way that Notre Dame can start to think about repaying its vast debt. Okay, thank you very much. I told you that was an easy one to finish with, Kathy. We have got some more questions. I'll forward them on to you separately because I know we need to give you 15 minutes before, before you're unleashed on the undergraduates as well. So just thank you very much for taking time to be with us. And I'm sure I speak for everybody when I thank you for that. Thank you, it was a pleasure to be with you. Great stuff, thank you. So, as I said, that has led us onto a number of themes that we're going to be talking about today, particularly, as I said, that transnational element, the idea of the global, but also the different disciplines, which, which Catherine came back to in the questions there. And so we're going to move to our second speaker before we have a break, which will be Dr. Brian Casey, who is a fellow in the history of Catholicism at the moment, at the Centre for Catholic Studies at Durham University. And he is currently working on the material of the Franciscan missionaries of the Divine Motherhood, and particularly their speedy, rapid growth, you could say, towards becoming a global religious order from the end of the 19th century into the 20th century. Now, what, what I would just add to this is that Brian actually started a week after the lockdown struck in the UK. So he's kind of spent a year grounded by himself. But because he's been able to build that relationship and working with the congregation, right, we have to acknowledge that they've been great with sending him material that he's asked for, images of it, so that he can work on it. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Brian for his talk. Thank you. Thank you, James, and hello, everybody. And it's great to see a lot of familiar names here as well. I especially want to welcome members of the FMDM community that are here in Ladywell and also in Baron the Slow too and elsewhere and I hope to see them all soon and also important to say hello to my mother who's here too as well so hello Mammy. Religious archives are important in allowing us to make sense of how religious sisters understood the events around them. They allow us to examine their lives for their own sake but also in the context of the wider culture and zeitgeist in which they lived and worshipped. Surviving records bear witness to various and con to varied and contradictory accounts that may not necessarily be linear. Choosing life as a religious sister offered a third model of womanhood that was seen to be a respectable alternative to single life. They were part of a wide ranging and varied network of communities that were all integral to the evangelizing mission of the Roman Catholic Church globally. The archives of the Franciscan missionaries of the Divine Motherhood show how the intersection between transnational and gender history can inform us as to the role of religious sisters on a much deeper and informed level. As well as practical everyday challenges, such as the construction and management of schools, hospitals, institutions, logistical operations, as well as clashes between the various actors in the world of the congregation. The archives also show the challenges and efforts made in, and involved in maintaining the all important spiritual side. They capture moments of tradition, both old and new, and, it can, and can allow us to make sense of their evangelizing mission. There are layers to the self-conscious construction 
of FMDM communities wherever they established their presence and continue to live, work and worship. And the archives show how members of the congregation reflected upon life on a personal community and congregational level. So this evening, I'm, I'm going to talk about some initial research regarding their management of hospitals in Northern Rhodesia, now Zambia and Singapore to briefly give us a sample and a taste of aspects of their global presence between the late 1940s and to mid 1950s. And support and distress, the research is limited on this. So any conclusions are tentative, subject to future research. The Catholic imagination, Robert Orsi argues, focuses upon God's presence in things and objects. Supernatural figures were important in the construction and operation of Catholic hospitals. People of all religious inheritance have entered the space and times of modern healthcare in the company of their gods, saints and spirits, Orsi remarked. Catholic religious saw their lives sometimes be, become constantly shaped and reshaped by their interactions with the local people, local and national governments, government agencies, wars, global networks, as well as the structures and indeed strictures of the Catholic Church itself. Reflecting and responding to these changes was not always straightforward, as change can sometimes be traumatically transformative. The work of Catholic hospitals affected the whole person, physical and spiritual, and had traditional values of serving all in need. They were not necessarily a means of conversion, and sisters were ready to go where others may not. They faced challenges in how to reconcile this in an acceptable way to the secular governments that they were answerable to, and being conscious of the diversity of local populations, while still maintaining their distinct Catholic ethos. A global mission of high quality healthcare reflecting best international standards is reflective of the FMDM interpretation of the Franciscan ethos of respect for the dignity of all human life. Mother Frances Spring's vision for the FMDMs was to remember and embrace the radical humility and compassion of St. Francis and St. Clair of Assisi. Following her election as congregational leader of the Missionary Sisters of St. Francis in 1937, she set out to improve the physical surroundings of the healthcare system that the, co that the congregation was building. She was energetically fastidious and determined in constructing a transnational network of healthcare, while also ensuring that the Franciscan tradition remained centered. Embracing her triple vision of missionary and maternity work and following St. Francis, she changed the congregation's name to the Franciscan missionaries of the Divine Motherhood in 1947, while continuing with determined energy to expand this empire of healthcare. Upon hearing about the choice of name for the congregation, Bishop John Jaglin of Clonfort, Ireland said, Franciscan missionaries of the Divine Motherhood sounds well, and it is an appropriate title and a mouthful. Adrian Hastings remarked that mission provided scope for female initiative that would rarely have been possible in the sending society. Women eventually became the majority in missionary work, but they mostly worked in subordinate roles. Mission work gave women freedom to do things, sometimes well, sometimes disastrously, which, have been, which would have been almost unthinkable elsewhere. And there was often a cooperation and freedom between female and male religious. Eager to expand to mission territories, Mother Frances was initially contacted by Bishop Alexander Roy of Bangaleo in Northern Rhodesia in 1944 to help run the local leper colony. In January 1946, the four sisters that were to establish the mission received their missionary crucifixes at a departure ceremony before sailing. Members of the White Father congregation had established a small mission at Cassava with doctors assisting them later on. Following the death of Dr. Jean Nicholjohn, they asked the bishop for professional medical assistance for the mission, which is primarily the care of lepers. The desire to build hospitals to best international standards that also reflected modern Catholic medical ethics was a core tenant of the FMDM charism. This is also manifested in the foundation of nursing schools in Ireland, for example, and also Singapore, 
to train sisters and lay nurses. The centralization of nursing training helped them to infuse their spirituality in all aspects of their medical work, as Mother Frances also wanted to form them into Catholic actionists. All this brought them to the attention of governments and bishops, who invited them to both build and manage hospitals. They moved not only because of a need to bring skills to certain places, but also to give a sense of being part of a global church, and many congregations did this. This was not without its challenges for the sisters, as they expected to have control over the administration of their hospitals, with minimal interference from physicians or bishops. Interference could create an awkward triangulation, which undermined their authority, and this was the case in Ballinasloe and Port Yonkla, as they clashed with for a very long time between Bishop Philbin of Clonfort and the doctors. And similar things go on with a lot of religious congregations, which meant that a certain degree of regal flattery and deferential obsequiousness could ensure that they could get the cooperation of the bishops. The formation, spirituality, tradition and training of sisters was to ensure that they were, they were robustly prepared to work wherever their presence was needed. Mother Frances believes that the constitutions and rules when adhered to would allow happiness and holiness to flourish in each community. Keeping the spiritual and prayerful sites centred is a challenge for any religious community. And the visitation of Alan Sloan noted this challenge in February 1953, suggesting that senior sisters needed to show more understanding to their junior colleagues that were struggling. The rigid adherence to rules could sometimes lead to dilemmas for sisters as well, with some being left to make difficult choices at times. In Cassava, they rose at 4 30 a.m. to begin their meditation, say the rosary, and recite the divine office. Then they went to mass in the mission church at 6 a.m., followed by spiritual discussion and breakfast and work in the dispensaries from 7.30 a.m. The business of the day is so Francis tells them to do the best they could in saying the divine office. Monsignor Killian Flynn wrote to Mother Francis in November 1948 about taking over the African hospital in Livingston. He was told that it was in good enough condition by members of the European expatriate community, and that they said that it was the European hospital that needed the investment. While he also agreed that it was not in a terrible condition, he remained firm in his belief that the African hospital was in much more need of improvement. They also started a training school for nurses, as the sisters negotiated with and convinced local staff about the importance of the in improving the standards of healthcare and hygiene in the hospital. The Northern Rhodesia government were keen for the FMGMs to establish a scheme of rural healthcare following their arrival in 1946. In October 1948, Bishop Timothy O'Shea, an Irish Capuchin and Bishop of Livingston, informed Mother Francis that the local Protestant mission was not going to object, which removed a serious obstacle. The Director of Medical Services was content with them starting with trainees, with four sisters and a nurse tutor initially sent to train local African women to work as nurses. O'Shea saw great potential for this, for this apostolate, remarking to Mother Francis that they could name their price regarding salaries. Once this was agreed, a memorandum was drawn up to establish the Livingston African Hospital as, a, as an African female nurse training school. Its object was to cooperate with government in the training of nurses. European nursing staff were to be qualified Roman Catholic nuns, with trainees and patients to be accepted, irrespective of religion, with the conscience clause inserted to protect religious freedom. The nursing qualifications were to be, were to be eventually recognised by the territorial authority. On the 5th of June 1956, Mother Frances informed O'Shea that Mother Mercy had been elected superior at Mackie. She was disappointed at the thought of leaving Singapore, where she had been in charge of the leper colony. She was well regarded by both patients and doctors, though Mother Frances said, the only thing wrong with her, my lord, is that she comes from the old country, County Mayo. In 1949, Mother Frances was asked about sending trained sisters to take over the management of the TB hospital in Singapore. Mother Angela and two other sisters that were based in Hong Kong after the failed China mission were willing to do this. They received a letter from the French-born Bishop of Malacca 
Dr. Michel Alcomendi in February 1949, indicating his willingness to let the sisters work in Singapore. She agreed that he could go and was willing to visit him if he needed to discuss the hospital further. Alcomendi had a long abiding dream of having Catholic sisters working in a hospital, telling Mother Frances that a large harvest of souls could be expected. He asked for 10 sisters, appreciating that this may not be possible, but would settle for six. It was a 100 bed hospital with some refurbishment and construction still taking place at this time. The complex cultural interplay was important for the sisters to be aware of, as he also noted that food for people of different religions needed to be prepared in different ways. And the sisters responded in this way by building kitchens that would be sensitive towards these cultural sensitivities. Francis agreed to send six sisters. One was trained in tropical diseases and another with TB certification from the Brompton Hospital. Others also had some TB experience and had worked with the lepers in Africa. Francis is willing to swap a sixth sister that was trained in housekeeping with a nursing sister if Alcomendi wanted. She acknowledged the privilege of saving souls and appreciated the support offered in sustaining their spiritual life. Alcomendi welcomed the news that Mother Francis will be arriving in September 1949 with four more sisters and said that thousands more would, would become closer to God because of their work. He said, I feel that the charity of the sisters will be the best preaching for, for our holy faith. The language of charity is understood by all and is convincing. By 1953, he said that they won great admiration from the public for the work they had done in Singapore since their arrival in 1949. So just to conclude, Catholic religious sisters have the flexibility to be sent anywhere in the world and their vow of obedience ensure that this is possible. The governments of Northern Rhodesia and Singapore asked the FMGMs to run local hospitals and institutions and bring European standards of healthcare. Future research in congregational archives in Africa and Asia, as well as Lady Well and Ballon Slow, alongside a wide array of other religious, local authority and national archives, will allow me to better map out their presence, using case studies of their work to examine how women in a transnational church became potent actors in healthcare, both at the local and the global levels. The FMDMs also engage in childcare, elder care, teaching, and also importantly, maintaining the Franciscan tradition which is central to their way of life and foundational to their story. Archives are the lighted rooms of our collective past. Their custodians possess the keys of these rooms, both actual and metaphorical. Allowing historians to the magic doors of these lighted rooms presents us with the responsibility of acting as tour guides to better understand how the past informs the present. This privilege carries important obligations to ensure that we properly understand what we are reading. Historians need to be cautious of the enchanted obsession in listening to the loudest voice coming from the archive. They need to search for the remarkable that has not been remarked upon and allow for the opening up of an uncertain space of dialogue and encounter with people of the distant and not so distant past. They allow us to reflect upon the past in a much more profound and informed way though we need to accept that we offer insight that is often combined with some degree of blindness in reconstructing and interpreting what we read. Our understanding will always unfortunately be incomplete because not everything survives. While archives can indeed affirm, they can also robustly challenge our assumptions. Congregations facing declining vocations are discerning the importance of capturing their history and heritage. The Franciscan missionaries of the Divine Motherhood are willing to be vulnerable in allowing their stories to be told, acknowledging that while truth-telling can be a very good thing and is a good thing, it can sometimes be painful and even hellish, but ultimately it is a healing process. As the congregation prepares to come to completion in Britain and Ireland, this process of discernment will hopefully save it from the condescension of posterity. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much for that talk, Brian, and touch bring us right there towards the international and transnational, as Kathleen was talking about uh, to us just before. So seeing nicely in, and of course, keeping us still very much in the modern period. So for those of you who don't want the modern, I should have said we will be shifting slightly earlier as well um, after we've had a slight break. So if people want to send just questions to me and I'll read them out again because I said we, we've just slipped a little of our time and I want to keep us as close to it as possible. And so I shall read them out. And I do have uh, one question here. Um, was the decision to take on leper hospitals and TB hospitals related to Franciscan discourses about outcast people or did the sisters accept invitations as they arose? Or in other words, was charism an important drive of choice or mission, of mission? That's a really good question. And I think it was. Um, I get the sense, and this is something I need, we need to look at more carefully in the more deeply in the archives when I get back, that some congregations will run certain kind of hospitals, for example, or certain missions. And I think it's not something I really thought about before, actually, to be honest, that this idea of the Franciscan charism in running leper colonies and TB hospitals would be part of that as well. And it's, I would think that it is part of that Franciscan idea and tradition as well. And also, I think because of the fact that Mother Frances Spring, because of her energy, she knew a lot of people all across the globe, particularly Franciscans. So they would have written to her, telling her about what was going on and asking her, would she be willing and prepared to send sisters? to work in these places as well. Okay, great. So what we're talking about then, and one of the things when we're looking for our themes to bring out is the importance of that charism and that ethos that's going behind it. Perhaps, Brian, when you're saying about uh, historians or literary scholars or whatever they may be looking at the materials to remember always the importance of that charism yep. and the global nature of that charism. Um, yep. I just wanted to ask a question as well, and obviously with, with what's been going on, you haven't been able to go to these places yet, but I just wanted to ask you a question about bringing together material that belongs to the same congregation, but is in different countries. So about visiting the different archives and how you piece it together, leading on from what Kathy was saying about the Rome-based material, but here with what you've got, a very specific one where they're in different countries. Yeah. Um. Well, I think what's important is to focus on the themes that strike me as well. It's not, we're not just looking at the FMGMs in Nigeria, a chapter on that, a chapter on them in Zimbabwe, a chapter on them in Ireland. They are these very important themes. And the big thing, obviously, is healthcare and exploring how they ran and operated hospitals, for example, in Ireland and we'll say in Singapore and Malaysia, but also to look at the personalities involved in these things and their relationships in the local communities. So, for example, in Ballinasloe, the there was a lot of, it was a very important hospital to be constructed in the local community because there was a government desire to have an auxiliary hospital built as part of a wider healthcare plan in the nationally. But the sisters built this hospital themselves, which became basically a local hospital for the community as well. And they would have gotten a lot of government support for that as well. But also we see local tensions going on as well in these places. So we see a lot of local tensions again because I've done a lot of research on the band, the slow side, you see a lot of these tensions going on there as well. But there's part of a wider network and wider conversations going on. So the sisters, Mother Frances and Mother Margaret, would have gone to North America, to Europe, to see best practice for the running and managing of Catholic hospitals there and bringing that back to Ballon Slow, bringing it to Singapore, Malaysia, wherever. They wanted to find the best that they could do in all these different areas. So I think looking at it from a thematic perspective is very important. And just focusing on healthcare at the moment because it's the most important part of their charism from what I can see. And obviously bias of having been from Ballon and Slow myself would have focused on that, but being familiar, also being an Irish historian by training, being familiar with these debates and discussions on 20th century healthcare, but seeing how these kind of ideas spread across the globe it's something I want to explore much more because I think it's a very, very important part of their story and not just to focus on their British and Irish story, which is very interesting in itself, but it's more, much more interesting and richer when we can do the wider suite of these archives. And then leading on from that, Brian, I have a question here from Anna James that uh, the medical mission sisters had a slight change of direction after Vatican II away from 
best hospitals, best practice like you're talking about, towards more accessible healthcare for the poorest. Do you see anything similar in the FMDMs? Do you know, I haven't had the chance to look at anything post Vatican II yet, but there is a discussion within some of the, co the congregational histories, they're just behind me there, about responding to the Second Vatican Council from that perspective. But because I haven't looked at that part of, the, of their archives yet, I'm wary to comment, but it's something that I think is important to be conscious of as well for religious sisters. I mean, I get the sense there's that maybe a certain re-energization re from within religious communities from Vatican II as well. But again, when I get back to the archive, hopefully sooner rather than later, I'll be able to answer that question in more detail. Good, 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 Brian. We can get you back on then in about a year's time once you've been unleashed in the archives to tell us more about it. I just finished touching on a lot of what you've said there, just a comment from Dr. William Griffiths, who worked with the FMDMs in Zambia in the 1980s, who okay. says that private hospital in Guildford, sorry, Mount Alvernia, um, was important for the financial support of their missions, but was also something of a monument of English Catholic history because it was where Hilaire Belloc died. So perhaps bringing at the moment what we've been talking about, the two ideas of the, the local, the national, but also the international all joined together in one example. So thank you very much, Brian. So I'm going to ask Sister Moira of the Canis of the Holy Sepulchre, please, if she will introduce Dr. Cormac Begadon, who is currently the Sepulchre Fellow in the History of Catholicism at Durham University. So Sister Moira, I shall hand over to you, please. Thank you, James. And thank you for the opportunity of speaking a little bit about our relationship with Durham. We are an autonomous community within the order of the Canonesses of the Holy Sepulchre. And our order is one of the most ancient in the church and our community's 378 year history within the order is one of the most long, colorful and diverse of stories. You're going to hear from Cormac a bit about that history. And it starts in exile in 1642, before our flight back to England in 1794. And being the thoroughly organized and practical woman that we are, that we were and are, a huge amount of our archive history, our books and key documents were shipped across with us. So we boast a very full record of nearly 400 years of religious life set in a varied social and church context. It would be fair to say that for the vast majority of those years, the full extent of the riches of our archives were unknown to most of us. Archivists tended to keep the keys hidden and carefully guarded secrets proliferated. The awareness that we as a community are reaching completion, the end chapter of our long history, has made us ask ourselves questions about the future care and location of our archives. Fortunately for us, we've known James's family for more years than he would like to have recorded and he lives very close to us. So his persuasive powers engaged our interest in the Center for Catholic Studies and their plans for research and guardianship of the traditions of many community stories such as our own. But far from simply finding a resting place for our archives into the long future, we found unexpected other golden nuggets. Suddenly, we found ourselves in the hands of a new community of academics and friends who were far more excited about our story than we had ever been. People who valued and treasured the role of women in the story of society and the church and so, who saw our history as being filled with unlikely heroines, emancipated women, fearless pioneers and adventurers. People who thought our story needed telling and who would help us to tell it. That was over five years ago, and I can't really overstate the impact and new life and vision that this link with the Centre for Catholic Studies has brought us. As a community all too well of our impending completion, we simultaneously became aware with pride of our past, seen in new light and appreciated by others outside ourselves. 
We had our initial years with Hannah Thomas, who you'll hear from tomorrow, who had the unlikely task of researching into the significance of our cemetery, the oldest Catholic cemetery in the country in uninterrupted use. Hannah turned talk of cemeteries and burial rites into the most fascinating of dinnertime conversations. And her stories of the challenges that our forebears face put each of us into a line of which we are immensely proud. Then came the moment to release the bulk of our archives into the careful hands of Palace Green specialists at Durham. And our experience was the same. Huge care and respect for every detail and an awareness of the emotional moment it was for us to be physically parted from our archives after all these years. And a very special thank you must go to Michael Stansfield in this context for the great care and courtesy which went hand in hand with his professional skill and acumen. Yet the benefits of that move have been immense. Hidden treasures emerged from the cataloguing and these have been shared with a far wider audience than we could ever have imagined. We understand now that our story and archives are of immense interest and value to historians and researchers and that the story will now become accessible across, across the globe, thanks to digitized technology. But the story is a human story too, and the story of our flight from mainland Europe in the throes of revolution across the channel to London is going to be retold through the eyes of the plight of so many peoples across our world in similar homeless flights from persecution. Our return to England, the levels of hostility and rejection we met also find many human parallels in stories of today. And we are aware that these aspects of our history are being valued and made relevant. And this brings us to today and to our most recent link through Cormac, who will speak to you in a moment. Cormac has had us eating out of his hand and wanting more. The love and respect that he shows for past and present, his great kindness and courtesy, combined with his academic gifts and skills, have made the last nearly two years so rich for us. I won't steal his thunder and reveal his findings, but suffice to say that his work on our history has been energizing, life-giving and enriching for us all, despite having had to hear most of it via Zoom. We would willingly talk further about the significance of our links with Durham and the Centre for Catholic Studies, but in a nutshell, it would be true to say that these connections and its consequences have been one of the most significant things that have been part of these last years for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Moira, for your very kind introduction and your kind thoughts on how the CCS has um, impacted so positively on your own community. And um, all I can say from my own perspective is, is that it's been a very benefit, mutually beneficial relationship. Um, as historians, uh, there's much for us to learn uh, by dialoguing with religious. So for everything that I've learned from you and your community, uh, let me, um, and you, always you're very, very generous welcome. Let me say a big thank you. Um, the canonesses or sepulchrines as they're sometimes known to historians were part of a movement of English convents on the continent that sprang up in the wake of the Protestant Reformation and continued into the 1790s when the French Revolution dealt most of these houses a fatal blow. This network wasn't insignificant uh, over 20 English houses stretched, were stretched over the Low Countries, France and Portugal, attracting considerable numbers of women. For example, the Who Are the Nuns project contains the records of over 4,000 women for this period. The women were spread amongst the houses of the Augustinians, Benedictines, Brigitines, Carmelites, Conceptionists, Dominicans, Franciscans, 
poor players, and of course, the canonesses at Liège. All these were enclosed communities, although the degrees to which each adhered to the contemplative ideal varied. How these women interacted and influenced the outside world has been a source of much in recent years, with uh, the dead to the world stigma, uh, thankfully, having been eroded thanks to the efforts of a new generation of scholars, some of whom are here with us today. These women engaged with the major political, philosophical, and religious developments of the early modern period, such as the Catholic Reformation, the Enlightenment in mainland Europe, frequently acting as conduits between their homeland and these movements connecting Britain and Ireland with mainland Europe. As Moira mentioned, they made a very brave decision to, uh, to entrust their um, archive and book collection to Durham University, with the bulk of their archives now uh, residing at Palace Green Library. And this evening, I want to talk about a number of aspects of the collections and how they might prompt us to further to uh, reconsider our, our understanding of the history of women religious. I just want to share my screen. Um, so this is a view of Liège in 1649. This is just to give you an idea of where the community was based. And if we zoom in, we see um, this is uh, Rue Saint Gilles, uh, and uh, where I've got this yellow marker, you'll see um, the, 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 the um, convent was located just uh, next to the um, St. Christopher's Parish Church. When I started exploring the collection, one thing in particular soon became apparent. Something very historically significant was taking place in the convent at Liège. This something was their interaction with the Catholic Enlightenment. Their embrace of the Enlightenment was not necessarily concerned with high theological, philosophical, or political debates, but rather, I suppose, was a practical relationship fostered through education and hospitality, which in turn fostered the transfer of ideas between uh, the continent and England, and vice versa. To describe an enclosed religious community as cosmopolitan might seem on the face of its country but cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan is exactly what the convent at Liège was. One of the aspects of convent life that contributed towards this uh, was its long-standing tradition of having an international makeup with its within its community, but also in terms of its student makeup and boarders or guests. Like many English convents on the continent, the canonesses operated a school which they commenced not long after their foundation in 1642. The portrait that I'm showing you now is an early example of this international flavor that pervaded convent life. And uh, this is a young Eleanor Darnell who was schooled by the canonesses in the er early 1720s. Darnell was the daughter of a wealthy Maryland planter, Henry Darnell II and Anne Diggs. The colony of Maryland, which had been founded as a safe haven for English Catholics in the 1630s, experienced its own Protestant revolution in 1689, after which the colony became less hospitable to its minority Catholic population. And Maryland Catholics, like their co-religious co-religionists in Britain and Ireland, they were forced to develop links with exiled Catholic institutions on the continent. Why did the Darnells decide to their only daughter um, across the Atlantic to Liège. As often was the case, there was a family connection. Eleanor's maternal aunt, Mary Stanislaus Diggs, was a nun at Liège. Diggs was in fact the first American-born member of the English convents in exile. On top of this, the canonesses had, canonesses had strong connections with the English Jesuits, who were a college at Liège and who acted as confessors nuns. Not a million miles away and there was the French town of Saint-Omer or it's often better known to us historians as uh, St. Omer's where large numbers of American Catholic boys were sent to be educated at the English Jesuit school. Records from the school show a number of Diggs boys there early in the early 18th century 
along with Eleanor Darnell's brother, Henry, shown here, with himself went on to serve as deputy governor of Maryland, having apostatized and later fleeing to Europe in disgrace. Now, under the Darnell name in the convent's borders accounts is the name Carol. Carol is, of course, a name synonymous with both Maryland and Catholicism's Catholicism in the fledgling US Republic. And while it's not definitively certain to which branch of the Carroll family the sisters attending the school at Liège belonged, it seems likely that they were Mary and Eleanor Carroll, sisters to Charles and Daniel, both of whom were recorded as having attended St. Omer's school at the same time. Upon her return to America, Eleanor, who I just showed you a moment ago, married one of these boys, Daniel, and together they had six children. The boys were all sent to St. Omer's and the girls were probably sent to Liège. But here's where things get really interesting. Eleanor, the former Liège schoolgirl's son, Daniel and sons Daniel and John, go on to play hugely significant roles in their nation's early history. Daniel, um, Daniel as shown here, is considered as one of the U United States' founding fathers, signing the Articles of Confederation. And then in 1787, he was delegate to the Philadelphia Convention, which wrote the US Constitution. Carroll was one of only two Catholics to have signed the Constitution. Daniel's younger brother, John, became a Jesuit priest. John had studied and taught at Liège and Saint-Omer, in the 1760s and became the first Catholic bishop of a, U a U.S. diocese in 1789. His con consecration took place, rather interestingly, at the newly completed chapel of Lulworth Castle in D Dorset at the hands of the English Benedictine Bishop Charles Wormsley. Uh, in, and then in 1808, uh, Carroll became the Archbishop of Baltimore upon the diocese's elevation to an archdiocese. Carroll is also remembered as the founder of Georgetown University. The English convents, uh, like most um, communities, depended on the generosity of benefactors. Unfortunately, a, a benefactor's book survives for Liège, and I came across one very interesting Carroll reference. It's dated 1740 and reads, received a legacy left to us by Miss Carroll, a Marylandian who died at the monastery of the Conceptionists in town. Now the Carroll family tree, for anyone who's looked at it, is somewhat amazed, but this may have been Mary Carroll who died in 1739. She might have been one of the Carroll sisters who were present at the convent in the 1720s with the aforementioned Eleanor Darnell. And if this is so, it offers another unique association with the founding fathers of the USA. This Mary Carroll was the aunt of Charles Carroll of Carrollton, shown here, who was a signatory of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Again, the only Catholic signatory. And while there's no Carrolls or Darnells, um, None of, the, none, of, none of the Carroll or Darnell family became professed members of the community. Their connections with the canonesses uh, undoubtedly was a factor in attracting 10 young American women to join the community in the 18th century. And this international flavor was reflected too in the school's makeup and outlook, as well as in the community's borders books. Schools, of, as I've already mentioned, were common to the majority of English convents in exile, acting as both sources of recruits to the religious life and, of course, useful sources of income too. But the school at Liège, I think, was in fact a little different to the majority of the English convent schools, both in terms of its size and also significantly in terms of its educational offering. And when we put these pieces together to form a bigger picture, we see that there was something very significant happening at the school, which places the school and the community, in my opinion, firmly within the wider Catholic enlightenment. The success of the school has largely been attributed to the foresight of one nun, shown here, Mother Christina Dennis. Interestingly, Dennis herself was not a product, product of the English convent school system, but had been schooled by the French Ursulines, 
who themselves were well known for their progressive modern approach to female education. In 1770, Dennis was appointed prioress of the community and thereafter embarked on a process of modernization and expansion that pervaded every aspect of the community's life. Aided by the financial support of William Starton, the 16th Baron Starton, Dennis could embark on a building scheme that would create a school in a more modern sense. Up to this point, numbers attending the English convent schools had been very, very small. For example, at Liège, the numbers never would have made it into double figures. Um, and here we have a prime example of this modernization and ambition. This is a very, very rare example of a printed school prospectus from the English convents, which dates from the early 1770s. The prospectus intended for um, English Catholic parents said that, we teach reading and writing to young boarding ladies, the English, French, Italian languages by principle, sacred history, arithmetic, the way of keeping books with double parts, recipes, tickets, and calculation of expense, difference of weight and measures in different countries, coats of arms, geography, use of globes of the sphere, the principles of natural history, as much as it can be, as it, as it can suit people of the sex, embroidery, and every use of a needle, the art of design and to paint flowers. Now we might look at this from our 21st century perspective and say, so what? Yet this was in fact a very modern progressive system of education that went beyond the traditional religious or devotional offering that was offered in many convent schools at that time. In the benefactor's books, we see evidence of gifts being made to the school of Italian books, globes and atlases. And interestingly, the prospectus stated that the school put on what it was called public displays, during which it, it was said, we expect progress from our young young ladies in the different parts of education that we give them. And here you can see their use of enlightened language, the term progress. Much time was spent on developing the girls into young ladies too, with marriage opportunities, no doubt in mind. Girls were offered classes in dance, music and portrait painting also, which resulted in what you might call a broad educational offering, but which could be tailored to reflect the wishes of individual parents too. There might have been a certain degree of pragmatism behind the decision though to expand the school. In France and in Habsburg lands, religious orders themselves were coming under increasing scrutiny regarding their respective social usefulness, both from the philosophes and from the state. And the running of schools was one of the ways in which religious communities could display their social usefulness. Whatever the reason for the expansion of the school, it soon began to attract large numbers of girls. The school's makeup was increasingly international too, with girls not just coming from Britain and Ireland, but from as far as way, from as far as way as America and the Caribbean. Significantly though, it attracted growing numbers of non-British, non-Irish, non-American girls too, with records showing large numbers of girls coming from the Low Countries, with smaller numbers from Germany, France, and from unlikely destinations like Sweden and the Canary Islands. But apart from the significance of the school for its size and what it taught, which are both in themselves very significant for our own understanding of the role of female religious in, in, of the, in the church in this period, what is significant is their relationship with the English Jesuit Academy at Liège. Now, the English Jesuit Academy at Liège had been relocated from Bruges and previously from Saint-Omer after the expulsion of the Jesuits from France and the Habsburg lands, finding a new home in Liège in 1773. A significant player in the school in this period um, was Father John Howard, uh, an English Jesuit, who like Christina Dennett, uh, was a native of Lancashire. Under the stewardship of Father Howard, the school became an almost immediate success. Jesuit education has had, it had been argued, gone into a decline from the middle of the 18th century until which continued up the society's suppression in 1773, unable to respond to the growing demands of enlightened parents. 
part of the trouble was the stringency of the governing gratio studiorum, which forbade things like the teaching of the sciences to boys under the age of 18. And even then, this was, it was unusual, unusual only for boys studying in the priesthood. This practice remained in place until 1774. However, the timeline of the uh, Jesuit school's uh, advancements at Liège are very, very revealing. Changes were afoot at the convent school far uh, before the Jesuit school. Uh, in his study of the English Jesuit education, Morris Whitehead argues that the new curricular venture at the English Academy took its main lead from recent developments at the convent school. So here we have a, a truly remarkable occurrence a rare and very early example of female education influencing the curriculum provided for young men. And therefore, this is very significant, contradicting our accepted uh, understanding of gender roles within the church. However, lest we be tempted to characterize the canonesses as 18th century feminists with secular tendencies, let me make two points which are the archives and book collections uh, spell out in no uncertain terms. These women were part of a revolutionary movement, but it was not that of creeping secularism. Now, let me take you back just for a moment to Christina Dennis, the foundress of the, uh, the, 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 um, the driving force behind the modernization of the school. Dennis, who was the community's procuratrix in, the 17, in 1766, had a vision of the Sacred Heart, which is documented in manuscript form. Dennis wrote, yesterday, the feast of your sacred heart was celebrated in heaven. I saw this divine heart displayed and as it, as it, as it were exposed to all. Devotion to Jesus' sacred heart became popular in the 17th century, following the visions of a French nun, Margaret Mary Alacoque. The mirror to most of us is one of the most important acts of Catholic devotion. It wasn't designated a feast day in the universal church calendar until the 19th century, yet it had been approved a, uh, uh, it had been approved a feast in certain countries in the 1770s. In the manuscript, Dennis, Dennis acknowledges that while plenary indulgence had been granted in the countries where it was observed, she said, quote, but it appeared to me it ought to be universal and made a day of prayer and not of work. Essentially, Dennett was arguing that the feast should be a holy day of obligation. Dennett, it seems, lost little time in promoting the devotion. The benefactor's book records an entry the following year showing that Lord Starton donated an image of the Sacred Heart to be placed in the convent chapel. In 1771, Starton again showed his generosity, paying for the installation of an altar to the Sacred Heart to be placed in the cloisters. The community through its education of young women, the majority of whom would return to secular, secular life, marry and become mothers, were conduits in this transfer of, of devotion. Thus, I think what we're seeing here in the convent, uh, with, with all its supposed restrictions imposed, imposed by enclosure, is the community partaking and its supporters in partaking in a truly global movement. By the time the canonists were forced to flee the revolution in Liège in 1794 as refugees and sail for England, the community had grown to be the largest of all the English convents in exile. Profession figures from the 1770s showing a veritable explosion of new entrants. And what I hope I've done this evening is to draw your attention to just some of the ways in which the community interacted and dialogued with the wider world in spite of their enclosed nature. Dead to the world, these women were certainly not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cormac, there for, for taking us, um, again, bringing us that international element, both in terms of the physical this time with, with people from around the world going to the school and the makeup of the school, but also the ideas, whether that's the Enlightenment or as you're ending with there as well, global Catholic ideas, fast growing devotions. Um, we've got a couple of questions, Cormac, that I'm going to, to just throw, uh, give to you now. So this one is from Marianne Gilson, who thanks you 
for the talk that you, you've given there, Dr. Marion uh, Gilson, I should say. Um, have you come across any evidence of students singing as part of the liturgy or joining the choir? So how much were the students involved with that liturgical life? Um, thanks so much for your question, Mary. Um, to answer it in short, no, I haven't come across any um, uh, records of, of, of students uh, singing. However, there's a number of documents which relate to um, the ceremonies, new entrance um, to religious life would have been a part of. So the profession ceremonies, uh, the clothing ceremonies, and th 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 these documents suggest, um, for example, they record, I remember one document says that there's uh, the orchestra played uh, as, 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 as the, uh, the young lady approached the altar. Now, I presume that it, it wasn't the religious community. <laughs> it wasn't the nuns themselves that were playing in this orchestra. It begs, it, so it begs the question, who was playing? Now, I think it's quite feasible and realistic to suggest that it was um, some of the girls because records show uh, that parents were paying for music lessons uh, with, with local music masters. Um, but I think some, some, some further digging might uh, reveal a little bit more about that relationship. But I, all I can say is that the, the, um, the records, the, man, uh, uh, the records, the archives are quite rich um, when it comes to, to, to music. Um, Thanks for your question, Mary. Thank you. And then we've got another question, Cormac, that sort of touches upon a lot of what we've been talking about. And I might say a few words as well about it is, um, is just in terms of your own research and thinking about archives, what do you think are the, are the most precious items within the archive? So in terms of what should really modern religious communities really be thinking about archiving for the future? That's a good, a very good question. Um, I mean, I think there's a there's a there's a huge amount of material that, that should be should be obviously prioritised, but that religious um, have to be mindful of the fact that sometimes the material that um, secular historians like ourselves consider most uh, illuminating may not be some of the material that they themselves consider. Um, uh, illuminating for their own community. So, for example, uh, did, did, this is something that the the, uh, the, the canonesses have a um, place a great emphasis on is, is is their migration narrative. For example, so when, when they return to England in 1794, uh, they write three. There's three editions of their migration narrative written. They're quite lengthy. They're about a hundred pages long. And they document the of the perilous journey that the community makes. Um, now, this document is not only of interest to the religious community, but but says a huge amount about um, the modern day refugee uh, crisis. For example, uh, these documents have very much uh, contemporary uses. Um, so that that would be one one, one type of a uh, document that that springs to mind. Um, you might uh, have more thoughts on, on this, James. I, I feel a little bit stumped by that question. I would say keep everything, but that's <laughs> and, and value absolutely everything because there is value in in so much of this material. But I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right, Cormac. I think probably um, the historian's reaction is hoard everything. The archivist <laughs> one is to look round in slightly in horror when we when when we'd say that. And of course, you can't keep everything. Um, and as I said, we'll run something in September about looking after the archives. But in terms um, of what's most interesting, that is quite hard to say, because, for example, some of the most illuminating documents that people are finding lots of material from are actually financial ones. And on the face of it, you know, who here likes dealing with our finances? Very few people, realistically. Yeah. But you can find all sorts of materials there, like Cormac saying about who is in investing money, for example, or what's being bought. So he could see, as he was telling you about what was um, coming into the school. So I think it's a case of don't necessarily think that something that looks useless isn't necessarily useless, perhaps is, is a good motto. But as I said, we'll deal more with that perhaps when we come to the archives, because like, I'm well aware we have archivists on this call as well. And um, 
you know, I'm not in the mood for having to do a runner before they all chase after me for saying hoard everything or, or, or mm -hmm. bin particular things. But as I said, I think it is to bear in mind that what you might think is not actually that interesting to some historians or to a lot of some will actually turn out to be the real gold dust stuff. Um, and it can even be something as simple, which although for, uh, you know, a member of religious, their profession documents are obviously hugely important, but even for historians, when we look back, it gives us all sorts of things it can do in historic ones like where they're from. Or for example, if you're dealing with Carmelites, and certainly what I've seen, some of the um, obituary books is the only place you'll find their proper name, because often they'll have only their name in religion. And again, so that's a really important thing. Um, Cormac, I'm going to, we're, we're getting close to the end, so just a couple of quick uh, questions. This one's from Liam Chambers. Um, and it says, does that Enlightenment influence endure through the 1790s and the move to England, do you feel? Thanks very much for your question, Liam. Um, having worked on the male, uh, male order, the Benedictines, um, who have a very different experience of enlightenment and have a, a much more, some of them adopt enlightenment in much more radical terms, you see that they, I think it's fair to say, are quite reactionary uh, when they return to England. Um, and one of the figures that I mentioned, Bishop Charles Wansley, uh, was a leader of this conservative ele element. I don't quite see that same response um, to the canonesses um, in, in, in that period. I mean, I think when, when you look at the educational offering, so when the canonesses return in 1794, they have a, they have a couple of years um, uh, itinerancy where they, before, they, before they actually settle at Newhall. But they reestablish a, a successful school quite, quite, quite early on. Um, and I know Caroline Bowden, who is with us here this evening, has done some work on this. And she's looked into the family uh, correspondence of a number of figures. Uh, one, I think it's is it Harriet Goldie, is, is one of the girls. Uh, and her, 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 her mother speaks, gives glowing praise of the educational offering that the canonesses offered upon the return home um, in the post, so this is post 1795. And she compares it very, very favorably with I think the offering that was, that was given by the poor Clares possibly in Rouen. Um, I think if it, the, some of the community would be better off uh, responding to this, but I think the community that would themselves say, for example, that they've always embraced uh, things like uh, ecumenism within the church and always had very favorable relations with, uh, with non-Catholics. And this, this, is not, this is not from the 1960s onwards. This is something that stretches back. I imagine that this can be traced to their to their uh, to their experiences in the 1760s, 1770s, 80s, and 90s and onwards. So what I would say is you don't get the knee-jerk reaction that uh, you do in some of the communities, some of the male communities, especially upon the return. I think there is a continuity there um, within the canonesses. Um, there's not the Evolution does not bring for them, although it brings a physical uh, departure from the continent. I don't think it brings an ideological departure in, 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 a, in any shape or form. Okay, thank you. Now, we've got quite a few questions. What I'm going to do, I'm going to try and wrap us up only five minutes over time. So I'm just going to go for one question. And seeing as we took archivists' names in vain there, I'm going to uh, <laughs> take a question actually from an archivist, Patrick Hayes. Um, and saying that he was really pleased to hear about the Carols of America and their daughters in Liège. Um, and he's just, you know, does this example serve to underscore the transatlantic or transnational character of the history of uh, uh, the sepulchrings and others? And he's asking as well, um, you know, were there other families from other parts of the English speaking world who sent children abroad for schooling? Yeah, so I, first of all, I should acknowledge um, Patrick's efforts in trying to explain the Carroll family tree to me over email, which I think I've, it's, it, for anyone who's looked at it, it's extremely confusing. So thank you, um, Patrick, for that. Um, 
Yes, I mean, it's not just the Carols and Darnells that are sending um, girls um, from uh, America to uh, Liège. For example, there's a, there's a family in the, I think, 1740s and 50s, the Sems uh, from Maryland as well, four of their daughters enter the community. Often it's the case that the, the children are schooled uh, at Liège before entering. As I said in my talk, there's in, in total there's 10 sisters from America in the 18th century, which is quite a substantial uh, proportion when you look at, when, you, when you think that it's just it's just one community alone. Um, whether or not this this is reflected in the history of other convents, I think it would be very significant to actually look into it and see whether it's the case. Um, as I say, uh, the point I was trying to make during my talk is I think the canonesses were offering something different. They were offering something unique. I know Caroline has said that the, the Augustinian canonesses in Bruges offered something similar, but on a, but on a smaller scale. Also the point where, why are Catholic families from the Low Countries, from Germany, uh, from France, sending their daughters to, to a, you know, an English convent school uh, when there was numerous educational opportunities for them elsewhere? And I think the answer is because of what was being offered was modern, it was progressive, it could be tailored to the individual needs of families, which for the 18th century was quite revolutionary. Um, but as I say, whether or not this, the, the, the transatlantic dimension is replicated in the other content schools is not something I'm aware of, uh, but I think it's something, I mean, it, I would be glad to hear if it is replicated uh, in, the, in the other communities, if anyone here has had that experience, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but I'm, as I say, please shout if you, if you, if you come across this, this transatlantic transatlantic movement. Great stuff, thank you, Cormac. And there, anyway, Revenge of the Archivists, who's making you have to call <laughs> out there for, for, um, for, for questioning for it. Um, we have, as I said, got quite a few questions there, but I'm going to bring us towards a close. And I'm going to in particular keep just a couple of comments from Sister Hannah Rita and Barbara. And we'll kick off tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening with them when we come back for the second part of this and about the types of material that's kept and what it can tell us. Um, and we can perhaps start contextualizing some of the stuff we're going to talk about tomorrow within that. Um, so tomorrow, what we're going to be doing, we're going to, as I said, start with that. And then we're going to be hearing from Dr. Hannah Thomas, who has worked with the Canisters of the Holy Sepulchre, as has been mentioned, um, in particular on their cemetery uh, buildings, who are bringing in a bit of material culture as well, and now works, very, uh, works with the Congregation of Jesus at the Bar Convent, and she's going to be talking about her experience with both. We're also going to hear from uh, Dr. Liam Temple, who's just started working on the Capuchins, and Scholastica Jacob, who is in her final year of her doctorate on the return of English Benedictine convents to England, uh, again in the wake of the French Revolution. And we'll be concluding with Professor John McCafferty, who works closely on Irish Franciscan material. But I think what I would just say uh, to round off this evening is the message that we've heard a lot here is about the international, the transnational, and the engagement um, that these religious congregations and orders are in. You know, historians like to talk about global history and things like that a lot. But I think what's become really apparent here that we can bring out is just how much material is in these religious archives that actually lends itself to that analysis. And yet, for all that they bring us that, they're kind of neglected figures within it, and they can really make a huge, um, a huge contribution to it. So it would just... Uh, leaves me then to thank our speakers tonight for, for joining us, uh, Kathleen Spence Cummings, Brian Casey, Cormac Begadon, and Sister Moira for her words of introduction to Cormac, um, and to thank all of you for attending as well, and I look forward to seeing you, what will be tomorrow evening for us, but uh, tomorrow wherever you may be. So thank you very much. <laughs>